to implore your maternal intercession. Obtain, O loving Mother, the granting of my requests. Through gratitude for favours, I will endeavour to imitate your virtues, that I may one day share your glory. Our Lady of Lords, pray for us. Amen. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Swallow. Mm. Anyway, this is ice powder. I don't know why I have to explain this every night. But it's not something to have in your mouth when that light goes on, I can tell you. Because you can't swallow that fast. But anyway, we're here, we're here together. And I don't know about you, but we in uh, Alabama had a terrible storm. It wasn't even a tornado, was it? What was it? A what? Straight line wind. What's that mean? Huh? Just wind going straight ahead. Oh, we know why? Nobody knows why. That's a dumb question to ask. Only God, huh? Oh, only God knows why, right? Hmm. I never saw a camera this close. Is it supposed to be that way? It is? Okay, here I am, everybody. But you know, it was kind of funny in our place because we always think we're ready for anything. You feel that way sometimes? You're ready for anything? Well, all we heard was one yell that said, Tornado! Well, we didn't, we have 100,000 square feet in that house and nobody knew where to go. <laughs> nobody. So they're all running to me and I said, don't look at me, I don't know where to go either. So I said, okay, we'll go to chapel. If he goes, we go with him. <laughs> so we went in there and we started saying, I advise this very much, that wind was, oh, it was so strong, it ate out some of the mortar from the block. It just went, shoo, went right in one place. And then our bell tower has been leaking. And I won't give the name of the company who built it, but if you don't fix it, I'm going to. <laughs> I hope somebody in that company heard me tonight. But anyway, they had to take the tile off the roof so they could walk on it. So wherever they took the tile off, it leaked. 
in a hundred mile wind and pouring. We're going around with these little buckets, you know, trying to catch the water here and there. And, and the, the gift shop where we had all our supplies and everything, the whole, the, it was leaking through the, through the, the lights everywhere. Anyway, I had many thoughts I never expressed. <laughs> Just wanted you to know that I had them, but I never expressed them. <laughs> I'm still thinking them, though. I made you. <laughs> I said there has to be a time even God loses his patience, you know. But anyway, I just wanted to share with you something that happened to me the other day, which was so, for me, it was exciting, just for me. I don't think it affects anybody else, but because I was so excited, I wanted to share it with you. Is that okay? Well, if it isn't, I'm going to share it anyway. <laughs> you know, I told you uh, many times how we got to build this absolutely magnificent temple. And when we were in Bogota, uh, we wanted to tell all the people in South America that EWTN in a year's time would have a Spanish network going into South America and Spain and Italy and many other countries. So anyway, we were there and I was invited by our guests uh, to see the shrine of Divino Nino. And uh, so he said to me, you know, you go up this hill, and there is the original statue, the original statue. Well, when we went to this basilica, um, it was a huge courtyard, big enough for 5,000 people. And they have 20-some masses a day over there. And um, so I saw this bust of a priest in the corner. And so nosy that I am, I wanted to go over and see who it was. So I go, and it said Father John Rizzo, which was my father's name. And I said to myself, well, at least there was one decent John Rizzo in this world. <laughs> Not a nice thought. But that's what I thought. So I said to Father, who is this priest? He said, he came from Italy. I thought, oh, figures. <laughs> You're going to tell me he came from Calabria next. I don't know where he came from. He said, but he was Italian. I said, OK. And very simple. Mm, OK. He said um, he had great devotion to the child Jesus. And uh, when he came from Italy, there, there was nothing there, you know, people very poor. And so he put two tables out. One table had the divine child on it, and the other table said mass. Well, the people came from everywhere, everywhere. And you're hungry, hungry people. So he's getting a little bit scared, you know. So he talks to the child Jesus out loud, and this, all these people listening, and he says, Divino Nino, do you see these people? They're hungry. They're all hungry. And if you don't give them something, they're going to kill me and smash you. <laughs> A typical Italian priest. <laughs> <laughs> and so, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, come these cartons and carts of food. And the, the poor man is more petrified now than he was before. And the people are going wild, you know. Well, now every week that happens, every week. So now the people are beginning to bring the sick. And they bring people on stretchers. They bring people that are blind. and can't hear. I mean, it is a crowd of people coming, all sick. Now, the poor man is scared for sure because they expect him to do something about it. And so he goes to the child Jesus again, and he says, look, um, 
You see these people, they're sick. And um, if you don't heal them, they're going to kill me and smash you. <laughs> now, I never talked that way to Chad Davis. I, I, I haven't even thought of it, but he was a simple man that had a beautiful relationship with the Bait Child Jesus. Well, all of a sudden, from way out at the end of the field comes the man yelling and screaming. He was crippled from birth, and he's walking, he's running, he's doing everything. Well, other people are doing the same. Well, he doesn't know what to do, so he goes to his provincial, and he says, I want to build a church, but that isn't the word he used but I found that out later. I'm gonna spoil my point if I say the whole thing right, okay? So, they say, no, we can't build a church, we don't have any money. He said, but the people have talent. So they let him build a small church. Now, Father's telling me all this, and I, I feel comfortable with this Father John Riesel. And I thought, well, you know, he's a simple man. He speaks to God in a simple way. And uh, I would like him. So, Father says, you know, you want to go up and see the original statue. It was just, oh, it's about that big, that's all. And so I'm going there, and the statue, oh, there must have been maybe as many people here tonight. And the statue's facing that way, and I'm facing this way. I'm just looking. I am just looking at the statue sideways. All of a sudden, he turns, and he's not a statue. He's a child. And he looks at me, and I never saw such beautiful eyes in my whole life. Never will again, I guess. And so... He looked at me and he said, build me a temple and I will help those who help you. And then all of a sudden he turns and he's a statue again. And I thought, my heart was beating a hundred miles an hour. And I, I started to cry and I thought, what is a temple? You know, I've heard of Masonic temples, Jewish temples. I never heard of a Catholic temple. I, I wasn't certain, but I heard him. And I didn't understand what he meant when he said, I will help those who help you. I didn't understand that either. So the sisters came up to me and they said, what's the matter? And I said, oh, nothing, nothing. So when I got home, I thought, I got to tell them, otherwise I won't be able to build a temple, you know. But I still never knew. And then a couple of months later, we were in Rome and coming out of the Basilica. I saw the word, this temple was consecrated on a certain date. So I thought, ah, there is a temple. So, now I'm back to where I was two weeks ago. Shitcha comes up to me and, and said, you know, this woman sent you a book on the Divine Child Jesus. I said, oh, I must have 150 of them. But they're not like that one. Okay, so I took it. And that evening, before going to bed, I thought, well, I think I'll read it, because he's so cute. You know, you can't resist a little child like that. I open it up. Guess who was there? Father John Rizzo. And, and look at that. Look at him. Well, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. You know, there he was. A big man, not too cheerful, <laughs> but says, Father John Rizzo, founder of the Divine Infant Jesus Parish. Parish? No, I said, well, I'm looking through the book. And what does it say? 
on December 25th, 1937, the first rock for the temple of the child Jesus was blessed. And then it says here, Father died before the big temple was built. And it says here, and my heart was beating another 100 miles an hour because he said temple to me. He didn't say parish. He didn't say church. He didn't say oratory. He said temple. And so I, I was so excited. And it says here that the divine infant Jesus temple was dedicated in 1992. Three years later, he tells me, build me a temple. Well, you got to be patient with me tonight. I've got asthma, bronchitis, a sinus headache, and my nose is running. Mm -hmm all on TV. So, if you don't mind, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, we're hearing a lot today on uh, all the terrible things going to happen to the world this century. The big earthquake, uh, the big, uh, what do you call this? Uh, under when earthquakes are under the ground, what do they call them? But well, anyway, under New York City is a massive earthquake about to happen. Not today or tomorrow, but before this century. You want me to do this, right? Okay, thank you. He's really a guard, but he does this mostly. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think we need to think of that. Fault lines, thank you. There are big fault lines under New York. There's big fault lines in California. I'm not telling you all to move. Where are you going to go? I'm only saying, as I have said a, a hundred thousand times somewhere, that uh, you, you need to get your soul ready. You know, I don't know why people are so afraid. Two weeks ago, I talked about hell. A lot of people live there now, don't you think? Sure. All of us are living in purgatory. You know, if this is heaven, Lord, save us all. <laughs> you know, we're, we're in the wrong place. This is purgatory. This is purgatory. And there are many things happening. Somehow we're in some kind of war. Nobody knows what. There are wars and rumors of wars. Well, we say it's been that way for centuries. True. But it was in the time of other people's century and other people's purification. There's a good book out called Sent to Earth. I'm not advertising, but I guess I am. It's an excellent book. It explains why, through the centuries, the Bronze Age and, and, and Rome, oh boy, you, you can see why the Lord took care of Rome. But see, what I don't understand is we're not afraid of sin. That's why people commit so much sin. You don't believe the consequences. See, you know what I think the Lord's doing? Nobody's paying attention to our lady over these wonderful apparitions we've had. Nobody's paying attention to our Lord, who's been bleeding in many statues. Nobody's paying attention to Fatima. Now, these uh, many, I don't say all of them were, but some of these uh, scientists, I guess you would call them scientists, okay? Physicists and whatever else they are, are saying to the people, look, it's not going to be the same anymore. 
now they have some kind of hot stuff going up up here, warming and, and all this stuff. See, you cannot abuse something constantly and not expect a reaction, whether it's people or the earth. It's going to respond. It's going to respond. I just want everybody in this world that listens to this network to be ready. That's all. In India, oh God, that was a terrible earthquake. You say, well, it can't happen here. No, kid yourself. Do you know there was an earthquake at the Mississippi River? It went backwards for a week. And the bells rang in Connecticut. Now you like that one? All I'm saying is, if you're Catholic, go to a confession. I know you don't want to stop your, uh, what do they call it today, your way of life? No, that isn't what they say. Whatever it is, you got to stop. You know, a man was saying to us, uh, he is an atheist, didn't believe in God, never did from when he was a kid. And he went to uh, uh, France with his, his professor, uh, art class, so they all went to France and he got terrible pain in his abdomen and his colon ruptured and he was dying. And he died, he died. And before he died, he was telling his wife that there's nothing uh, else, you know, that is the end of everything. It's just nothing but a black hole. Well, he dies, and all of a sudden, he feels himself up off the table, and he's looking down on his body. And he's looking at his wife, and she's crying, and he's saying, hey, I'm okay, don't cry. Well, he's not, he's dead. Dead or not, darn it. And he doesn't understand why she doesn't hear him. And he say, I'm alive. Then all of a sudden he hears two men speaking in the hallway in English. Now he's in France. So he go and he heard the one man say, He's not coming yet. Well, now he's inquisitive, see, so he goes outside, and these are two, he thinks, two men. He said, look different, though. They had very elongated faces. And they told him to follow them. Immediately, there was a dense fog, and he said, it was fog, and the fog he never saw before. And the further on they walked, the denser the fog. Suddenly, these men begin to insult him terribly. They begin to use the worst kind of language. All of a sudden, they're pushing him back and forth. And then he said they had like long fingers and they start pulling his skin off, but he said he didn't have any skin, but he felt like he did. And suddenly, here's a man who didn't believe in God, wanted nothing to do to God, and he says, oh, God. And those two just went as far back as they could go. Now he's scared. He's scared. And he said, Jesus, save me. Immediately, the fog left. And there he was. He saw Jesus. And there were a couple angels there. Probably one was his arm. And they began to show him like a television screen his entire life, from when he was a baby all the way to being in France. And he said, all I wanted to do is stay there. I didn't want to go back. And Jesus said to him, you must go back. You're not ready. Well, he got back and they began to operate. He became a minister. 
There is a hell. There is a hell. I didn't want any of you to go there. Your way of life may not be too good, huh? But it's never too late. And some of you that are Catholic, you have that awesome uh, opportunity of going to confession. What a wonderful thing. So, I'm not going to, you know, preach hell and, and, and fire, but I just want to remind you, remind you. They say, don't scare people. Do you see the movies that your kids watch? Which scare me. Do you see the sweaters they're wearing with these ugly, ugly beings? Do you see the games they play? And you're telling me hell? Well, they've seen hell. They just don't know what to call it. Oh, I've never seen such grotesque games in my life. These are children's games, children's cartoons. See, So don't, don't give me that thing. Oh, you scare me. I want to scare hell out of you. That's what I want to do. That's my job, is to be a thorn in your side. I want you, every time you have a, an opportunity, I didn't say temptation, I said opportunity for some kind of sin, I want my face before you, making you as miserable as possible. <laughs> I ask our Lord to do that. That happened one day, this young girl was going to commit suicide. And um, she was running. She was going to jump over a bridge or something. And suddenly she said she saw my face in front of her. And she stopped dead. And she changed her mind. I don't ask God for big things. Just a lot of little things. Like giving you strength and courage to carry your cross. We all have a cross. We all have a cross, all of us, in some fashion. Carry it. Don't bury it. Don't drag it. All you old people get so discouraged. Hey, you got one foot in the grave. What's your problem? <laughs> Where are you going? But there's no place for you to go up, up and down. You know, you and I are past this middle middle or age thing, you know, we're, we're past that. When you find your face in the middle section of a senior, senior magazine, you know you've made it. <laughs> That's what I saw not too long ago. This is my face right center page on a senior magazine. That's what am I doing in there? You know, I know what I'm doing in there. See, it doesn't matter how old you are. Young people die, old people die. See, sometimes we die suddenly. We don't want to do that. But see, when you die, it's over. That's what's so final about it, isn't it, huh? It's over. And then you have to stand there for judgment. You're all by yourself. I know that. There's nobody there with me. Nobody. I was by myself. So just think about that. Things are tough and they're getting tougher. All I want you to do, I hope you live a thousand years. But if you die, I want you to die well. I don't want you to go to the other place. I was going to take tonight the 20th chapter of the Matthew and you know, I felt sorry for the Lord the other day. First, he appears to everybody, and, and our lady's appearing seemingly to everybody, and nobody's listening. Yeah, listen. I was surprised and a little hurt for the Lord because now he's using atheists and he's using uh, professors and, and scientists 
to tell us that this world, this world we know in this century will not look the same. The glaciers are melting. I mean, we're going to have a whole new world. That's oh, wonderful. I said, Lord, I know I'm not going to live to be 178. But when I get to heaven, could I peek down and just see how it's going to look? I mean, it has to be wonderful. When the Lord gets done purifying this whole wide world, it's going to look so beautiful because it won't have sin on it anymore. And everybody will love each other because he promises here a new heaven and a new earth. Well, what's new about it? Well, it's not new now, I can tell you. It's getting old. It's, it isn't even what it used to be when, when I was a kid. My grandma never locked the doors of her house. Did your parents, all of you up in your years, you know, did you ever lock your doors? Never. Never. My grandma's door was always open day and night. Okay, you want to put a waller on your house now. See, the world's different. Oh, he's going to change it. Oh, it's wonderful. We'll have grass greener than you've ever seen it. You'll have beauty you've never seen before. There'll be peace everywhere. Your families will be one family again. There won't be all the things there are now. That's why I look forward to it. I say, Mother, you not you look forward to chastisement? Yeah, yeah, I do. Because of the end result. I look forward to your kids having a happy time of living in a home that's loving and understanding and in a place that's safe. I look forward to that. I look forward to the church being vibrant again and not so divided. Every time you go to the mass somewhere, it's different. Like an electronic church, you know? Every time you go to mass, you get another shock. I want it to be one holy Catholic apostolic church where people of all faiths come to that fold. Oh, I look forward to that. Let's see what our dear Lord says here. This is about the vineyard. You know that? It says, now the kingdom of heaven is like a, loan, uh, a landowner. You all own land, don't you? Everybody owns something. And he went out at daybreak to hire workers. Well, that sounds pretty normal. That's pretty much like we used to do when we built this place. And he made an agreement with the workers for one denarius for a whole day. Not bad. For that day, it wasn't bad. Now, going out about third hour, maybe nine o'clock, something like that, he sees some people standing there, no work. And he said, uh, now you go in my vineyard too. I said, okay, one denarii. Then he goes to sixth hour in the ninth. That's uh, maybe three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And they all go. He says, I will give you a fair wage. Do you notice today nobody gets a fair wage? I had an employer say to me the other day, you know, I, I like to hire people that like to work. I pay well. The first thing they ask is, how much vacation do I get? <laughs> oh, I said, that's nothing. I had a girl apply. She wanted to know how much debt we had. I said, oh, you really want to know? She said, yes. I said, you expect to pay it? <laughs> Why are you so nosy if you don't want to do something about it? Well, I just want to know what I'm entering into. I said, oh, hmm. anything else you want to know? She said, well, I'd like to know if we have vacation. I said, vacation? She said, yes. 
I said, what is that? <laughs> she said, they cage. you don't know what vacation is? I said, well, I don't think I do because I've never had one. I said, I work for God. This, uh, I'm, I'm off on Sundays, but I don't know anything about vacations. What would I do on a vacation? She said, well, I wouldn't know. I said, I don't either. <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do on a vacation. Most people I see come home are dead tired. <laughs> I mean, you look haggard. You look tired. I don't know, I would just sit home and enjoy it. That would be a good vacation, I guess. So I don't understand, personally, I don't understand vacation because my day is the same every day. When I was younger, I was too poor. Now that I'm older, I'm too old. So I don't have a problem with vacations. So then she wanted to know, after vacation, you know, uh, did she go home for a visit? And I said, sweetheart, you don't have a vocation. Because all you do here is love Jesus and the Eucharist. And we adore him day and night, and you don't have a vocation. I don't know what happened to the poor girl, because we're all in that mood, you know, of what do I get out of it? Oh, that's not too good. What you put in it is what's important, not what you get out of it. We will have our reward or whatever we have up there. I wouldn't care if the Lord put me at the gate just watching everybody else have a good time. See, when we deal with God, we have to love him for himself. And you've got to learn something here tonight. Now at the eleventh hour, he went out and found more men standing around. Oh, boy, you're up there now. There's really not much left to a work day. He said, "Why well, you've been standing here idle all day? Just because no one hired us. He said, oh, go in my vineyards. Oh, they work maybe two hours. Now, the owner of the vineyard said to the bailiff, Call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with the last arrival. Two hours. Get it? Two miserable hours in the cool of the night. No sun. Don't have to worry about lunch. Two hours. Okay. Ending with the first. Now, do you want to add insult to injury? Okay. The first were still working while the last were getting paid. <laughs> How do you like that one? Hmm? Are you beginning to get upset? No? Yeah, you should. Now, when the first came, they expect to get more out the same denarius. Now they're beginning to think. Hey, they said. They grumbled. These men took, came last. Oh boy, look here. And they only work one hour. <laughs> oh boy, this is great. <laughs> and you treated them the same as us. Getting to you, huh? Well, and we have done a heavy day's work. Here it comes. In all the heat. And he said, my friend, I do you no injustice. Did you not agree from one denarii? Yeah? Then take your earnings and go home. If I choose to pay the last as much as I pay you, do I have do I not have a right to do what I want? 
or are you jealous of my generosity? Oh, you see? This reminds me of the woman who came to me one day. I told you this, but we always get new viewers. And, and she did have a hard time with her husband. I mean, she did have one hard time. Well, he dies. But she was so upset. She said, do you know what that rat did to me? I said, uh, no. I wasn't sure I wanted to know. <laughs> she said, he wasn't even baptized when I married him and went through hell. I said, OK. Well, she looks at me. She said, on his deathbed, boy, she's getting hot. He was baptized. He got all the sacraments. He went to confession, and he died. <laughs> I said, well, aren't you happy? No, I'm not happy. The rat went straight to heaven. <laughs> I said, well, aren't you happy with that? No. I want him to suffer a little bit. God. You know, if it was that bad, you'd think you'd be happy. Well, this is what our Lord's talking about. See? That's what he's talking about. There are many people that steal heaven. Like the great thing, the, 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 the thief on the cross, did he steal heaven? Oh, he suffered, though, don't you kid yourself. The one went to hell. The other went to heaven. This day, our Lord said, you shall be with me in paradise. You know how long Peter had to wait before he died? And then he died upside down on a cross. And here's this thief, you know, a uh, thief. But he admitted he was guilty. He deserved what he got, and he accepted <coughs> it. And all he said was, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did our Lord say? Like the merciful Jesus. He says, this day you shall be with me in paradise. Now, don't you want to go to confession, huh? Don't you want to change your life? Otherwise, you're going to be like these people. You're taking chance, taking chance. You didn't take too many risks, you know. And like that atheist I was talking to about, you may not be the one chosen to come back. And what did our Lord say? The last shall be first, and the first last. What does all that mean? Well, it means that if we pray for the hardest sinner, the hardest sinner, if you pray, keep praying for that person in your life that you want converted, don't stop. He may come back the last minute, the last second, the last instant he can come back and then be with God forever. And we have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. This is Sandra from San Diego. Oh, wonderful. What's Hi, your question? Hi, we love you here in California, <laughs> Mother. <laughs> Thank you. My question is, is Jesus more merciful than he is just, or is he equally both? God is infinitely merciful and infinitely just. See? It is an act of God's mercy that he is just. I want to repeat that. It is an act of God's mercy that he is just. Can you imagine walking around with all these people from hell all day long? Ooh. 
Hell is the justice of God, but he doesn't put anybody in hell. That person goes to hell on his own because he cannot stand God. You know, I asked a priest not so long ago, a friend of mine, I said, have you ever been present, you know, at a deathbed that you really feel this person went to hell? He said, only one. And I said, but what happened? He said, I came in and I wanted him to go to confession. He wouldn't. He cursed God. And he was in the act of dying. And I, I put the crucifix to his lips and he took it and he threw it against the wall. And he said, I don't want to be with God forever. Well, I would suppose it'd be hard to judge that too, but everybody, anybody, anybody that goes to hell is not placed there by, by God. Uh, they go because they cannot stand the holiness of God. See? If you live a filthy life, you could die being happy with the filth. That's the way it is. And so God's just, if God were to chastise the world at this point, now all of you think hard. If he were to, to chastise the world tomorrow and make it a thousand times better, would you say that's a good thing? Hmm. Wouldn't you? They have a, the company who built the, the temple and, and the monastery is still there. He's a wonderful man. And he, he did something sweet the other day and I said to him, may you live a thousand years. And he looked at me and he said, no. Not the way the world is today. If it gets worse in 10 or 20 more years, I don't want to stay here. And I was surprised because I guess I didn't expect it. But I knew what he meant. If you Eat or not eat, but smoke cigarettes. You're going to get lung cancer. There's, there's no doubt about it. it. Takes time, but you're going to get. It. If you drink a pint of liqueur or whiskey or wine a day, hey, your liver's not going to take it. It's not made to be pickled. <laughs> you're going to get it. You can't blame God. See, it's just going to happen, that's all. We, as human beings made to the image and likeness of God, that have memory, imagination, intellect, and will, we have to take the consequences of our mistakes and our sins. You've got to take that. You're in some kind of dream world if you don't think you are. So, to answer your question, I go to California by way of New York. Um, yes, there is God's justice and, and mercy. Both are infinite. I wish we all understood that. It would be a different world. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? I am uh, from Illinois. My name is Charles. Okay, Charles, what's your question? I've been reading the lives of some great saints, St. Uh, Francis and St. Uh, Claire of Assisi, mm -hmm. uh, St. Uh, Claire of, uh, well, uh, St. Uh, Teresa of Avila. Yeah. And I find that the latter, I feel that I should be on on my pilgrimage to heaven. I'm not even on it yet. You're and not fact, what yet? What is he? Oh, well, if you're living, you are. 
And you are living, definitely. If you're striving, if you're reading the lives of the saints, at least you're making an effort. But you see, you're reading the lives of mystical saints. Why don't you go to Mother Cabrini? Don Bosco, who, well, every saint is different. The little flower of Jesus. Read those saints that are more akin to your way of life. They worked, they ate, they slept, they drank, they had their, their big crosses, their little crosses. The difference between the saints and ourselves is that Jesus and Mary was a part of their daily life. We seem to have two lives, one wrapped around ourselves and sin and everything else, the other, well, on Sundays. We're pretty good. So I, I think... Uh, I think that you have to understand holiness is for everybody. Now, did I answer that question? No, I did? Okay. Is there another one? There is not. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're all in this together. The world uh, is slowly going down. And we have to lift it up. Talk to Jesus. Just talk to him like you would talk to each other. Or talk talk to me. See? You can talk. He loves you to talk to him. He loves you to tell him everything. Little things. Good things. Happy things. Every time I get a new pair of shoes, especially now since I can walk without braces, I go show it. I know he knows. He's God. He knows everything. He wants me to tell him. He wants me to thank him. I go there. I say, thank you, Jesus, for the new shoes. Maybe you could work on him stretching a little bit. <laughs> Feel kind of tight. Anyway, bless him. Isn't that what he meant when he said, unless you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom. You need to do that, see. Just a child. I was looking up at the water pouring in the other morning, night. It was night. Well, it looked night. It was only about 3.30. I said, Lord... Do you remember it took five years to build this thing? <laughs> five years. And the first storm, real storm comes. And it looks like somebody's gonna take a bat. <laughs> I mean, I never saw so much water coming down. And remember all you people who put it together. <laughs> All you people who have the tiles still off. It's not a threat, eh? Hey? It's not a threat. <laughs> I just want to keep dry, if you don't mind. Well, I got to go. I love you, and God loves you infinitely. Bye now.
To order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. Hello, family. In today's world, we rarely hear about sacrifice. On the contrary, most advertisements, movies, and television programs tell us that we should indulge ourselves in whatever makes us happy. This is why the season of Lent is especially important. It provides an antidote for the excesses of society. And when we fully engage ourselves in the practice of Lenten sacrifice, we grow closer to God. At EWTN, we help you on your Lenten journey with inspirational shows that teach you about the faith, devotional programs such as the Stations of the Cross and the Holy Rosary, as well as daily Mass. We are able to produce and transmit these programs because of the grace of God and because of your prayers and generous support. If you have been encouraged by our programs, inspired by our devotionals, or better informed by our news, please help us to continue our mission so that the gospel message can reach even more people around the globe. Thank you for being a part of our EWTN family, and may God bless you. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Please make your gift today by going to EWTN.com forward slash donate now. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama 35210. It was during Elizabeth's reign that the Church of England lost all claim to the apostolic succession. The Act of Uniformity stipulated how the people of England should worship. Everyone had to go to the Anglican Church or be fined 12 pence per week. We remember Mary uh, nowadays as Bloody Mary, although there were probably about two or three hundred um, Protestants executed during Mary's reign. That number, of course, pales compared to the number of Catholics uh, who would be executed under, under Elizabeth. It is important that Christians of the 21st century understand the Protestant Reformation because we cannot understand the modern world without understanding the Reformation. People sometimes ask us, is it marriage supposed to make you happy? Well, the answer to that is a bit of a surprise. Firstly, it's not supposed to make you unhappy. Let's get that out of the way. But actually, if you stop and think about it, we would argue that marriage isn't supposed to make you happy. Happiness is a consequence of a married life well spent. But marriage is really to make you married. It's to make you holy. If you live a, a well-lived married life, then happiness follows. But it's not the purpose. It's a subtle difference, but that mindset change is really important. One of the dangers of people that approach their marriage as being for the purpose of making them happy is that any time that they're not happy, and it will always happen because uh, you know we live in the real world and things go wrong, they'll conclude that marriage is failing. And that's a real risk. And they tend to, people who think that the marriage is supposed to make them happy tend to exit marriages way too quickly and too easily. So if I start saying that I'm unhappy, then I want to be happy, so it can't be my fault. So whose fault is it if my marriage is unhappy? It must be hers. No, it's she's his. The, she's the problem. So I've got to get rid of her to be happy. Well, it's the completely wrong mindset. And if, you, if you're not sure about it, think of it this way. If I said the purpose of food was for pleasure, you'd say, no, it's not. It, it's food is pleasurable, but its purpose is nutrition. Well, it's the same with marriage. The purpose of marriage isn't to make me happy. The purpose of marriage is for us to learn to be in love with each other, to really love each other. And if we do that, you know, and if we have a holy marriage, you know, trying to do that together with God's help, then will we be happy? Of course we will. But it's not the purpose, it's an outcome. It's, a, it's not the, the reason we become married isn't for happiness, it's just the result of a good marriage. 